we are all familiar with off-brand or imitation products, right? We encounter them in every avenue of life. The biblical writers and those to whom they were writing were familiar with iconic and imitation items as well. They didn't have brands the way that we do today, so the idea is not applicable in that way. But they still would have had a familiarity with the ideas of icons and imitations. And we can use those ideas, as well as how they are evident in our world today, to illuminate our scripture for us today on TV Church. Perhaps in the past year, you've heard of the show Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso has taken the world by storm, winning the praise of both critics and fans alike. The premise behind the show is a bit slapstickish. It's a former Saturday Night Live cast member, Jason Sudeikis, who plays the role of Ted Lasso, an American college football coach who is hired to coach an English Premier League soccer team. But what starts out as a slapstick becomes a lovable, emotional, and heartwarming tale. As the show follows Ted's fish-out-of-water routine, the other people that Ted encounters, even some of the most hardened-by-life characters on the show, cannot help but be positively overwhelmed by his kindness. And as we watch, even us, the viewers, are sucked into the story, rooting for Ted and left with the desire to know him, to be more like him, and live in a world where more people act more like him. Calling the show a countercultural masterpiece, columnist David French writes of Ted Lasso, For a moment, we saw the world not as it is, but as it should be. And it was a far better world than the one that we have made. For a year in which we've seen struggle and loss because of a worldwide pandemic, racial strife, and a string of deaths and injustices, a biting and bitter election season in which those who disagree with us are not simply fellow Americans with different ideas, but mortal enemies that must be crushed, or in which the world is ready to pounce on any mistake that you make and amplify it until you've been destroyed. For a year like that, in which there appears to be no end in sight. Why is it that Ted Lasso has struck such a powerful chord with so many of us? In a letter to the church in Ephesus, or what we now call in the Bible, the book of Ephesians, the Jesus follower known as the Apostle Paul wrote to a group of other Christ followers that were experiencing similar hardships to what we have experienced in the past year. In his letter, Paul encourages the Ephesian Christians, in spite of their hardships, to set aside differences with one another and bind together in unity under Jesus. He uses an analogy of our body, that just as our arms and feet are different, but work together to serve our will, so then we unite, despite our differences, to work together and serve God's will. Then he begins telling them what this looks like for them. If you are a thief, stop stealing. If you lie, stop lying. If you have any bitterness or anger or rage, get rid of it. Serve each other. If you're a wife, this means serve your husband. And if you're a husband, this means serve your wife. If you're a child, this means honor your parents. And if you are a parent, this means do not overburden your children. If you are a servant, honor your master with your work. And if you are a master, treat your servant like they were your brother. Because in God's family, they are. Paul sums up this entire idea in chapter 5, verse 1. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are His dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered Himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. For those who follow Jesus, or if you're not a follower of Jesus, but you wonder what being a Christian means, this is it. This is what that life is about. Imitate God. When you were growing up, was there a TV character or someone in your life that you wanted to be like? For me, it was Zach Morris on Saved by the Bell, the popular guy at school who everybody knew and who dated the head cheer cheerleader. I tried to carry myself like Zach. I tried to model his fashion sense. I even tried to comb my hair like his. I still do. Or maybe for you, it wasn't someone you wanted to be like, but something that you wanted to have, but you couldn't have. So you settled for the imitation. Growing up, for me, instead of the Reebok pumps that I wanted in elementary school, I received a knockoff brand. And instead of the starter jacket that I wanted in middle school, I received a knockoff brand. And instead of the Timberland boots that I wanted in high school, I received a knockoff brand. And now that I'm an adult, 
I usually purchase the knockoff brand. Maybe some of you have knockoff brands or even imitation products. In the internet age, they're easy to get. Maybe you have a handbag that resembles a Gucci or a Kate Spade. Maybe you have a sports jersey that isn't the official high dollar one, but the less expensive replica variety. Or maybe you do your grocery shopping at Aldi, which is brimming with proprietary products that are entirely meant to replicate a bigger, more known brand or variety. Whatever the case, we are well familiar with imitation or knockoff products. They are made to look or function like the original. It's an idea that would have stuck with the readers and hearers in Paul's day as well. Paul's writing to a Roman audience, and the Roman Empire is at its height. But the ancient Greeks were the most influential culture before the Romans, and Greek culture, philosophy, and language still permeated the known world. Think of how we today are Americans, and America stands on its own in the world, yet we still speak the language of the most influential nation in the world before us, English. That was how Greek worked in a Roman world. So writing this in the Greek language to a people heavily influenced by Greek culture, Paul uses an interesting Greek word here. It's the word mimeomai. You might think, well, I don't know what that word means, but you'd be wrong. It's where we get our English word mimic and the word that we use to describe the art form known as miming. It's language of the theater. Now, miming is sort of a laughable or easily ridiculed method of acting. But in Paul's day, it was a well-known and sought-after form of satire or comedy. In fact, miming was so widespread and so widely regarded that even one of Rome's own leaders, the Emperor Nero, acted as a mime. Unlike in our day when Ronald Reagan or Donald Trump were in movies and on TV before becoming president, Nero acted while he was an emperor. That's how big of a deal miming was. So perhaps in our day, the closest thing we have to this is the comedic forms of impersonation or sketch comedy. Think of a comedian like Frank Caliendo, who not only can imitate the voice of many well-known people, but mimic their facial expressions as well. Or SNL, when someone like Larry David impersonates Bernie Sanders, or Tina Fey impersonates Sarah Palin. I'm 
nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, nothing else, no, nothing else, nothing else will do. I'm Kristen Prasad, Minister to Kids and Families at First Baptist Huntsville, and today I'm here with Karen Mockenstrom, who is the Executive Director of Fantasy Playhouse Children's Theater. So Karen, for those who aren't familiar with Fantasy Playhouse, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure. Fantasy Playhouse Children's Theater and Academy exists to bring the magic of theater and arts education to the families of our region. Um, we serve generally 29,000 people in 49 counties in the state of Alabama, 23 in Tennessee and we do that through a variety of services. Our core programming are our main stage season at the BBC Playhouse which is the magic of live children's theater. Additionally we have an education department that serves ages three through adult with everything from preschool classes uh, to musical theater to Shakespeare to technical theater to filmmaking um, and everything in between and then also we have a school partnerships program where we bring actually classes to after schools directly into the schools and in 2018 we launched our first professional theater touring company with in-school touring shows. That's awesome that, and a lot. A lot. Um, so you have a new facility coming. Can you tell us what you'll be able to do with that? We can. We're going to be able to do everything that we're doing now and more and the beauty of that facility uh, is the fact that it's less than a mile away from here so it's in the heart of Terry Heights and Hillendale um, and we we will actually be bringing all of our programming under one roof. So that's very exciting. It's going to serve three purposes. Uh, it will be a destination for family 
family-friendly and family-centered entertainment. So we envision the um, operations happening six to seven days a week with everything from toddler puppet shows for drop-ins uh, to, of course, all of our ca classes and camps to destination field trips uh, for children and adults because we do some corporate team building. Um, and then we'll also, um, the second tier of that is it's really going to expand the opportunity to be able to teach STEM, STEAM mm -hmm. education, so workforce development. So a lot of people don't realize this, but all of technical theater, including filmmaking, I'm looking at this wonderful crew here, is all based in STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. And when you add the A, you get STEAM. So it will. there will be a full design studio, there will be a film studio, a music studio, so we'll actually be, be te teaching not only performance in front of the camera or in front of the microphone, but everything that goes into the engineering workforce development there as well. And then the final thing that the building allows us to do is it is community revitalization at its best. Terry Heights and Hillendales are the home of our scholarship students and our scholarship families. And so all of those services are going to be within walking distance. That's amazing that you'll have such an impact on your com community. Children's theater is so important to a community. And it's really great that you're here. We're really excited about what the future is going to bring. We are and too. Thank you for joining us. You're today. welcome. I it. I, you're welcome. I want to just explain um, theater arts is really important to kids. We know that children that are involved in theater arts education are more likely to excel at science and math. They're more likely to vote at an early age, and they are more likely to. Um, actually graduate. Areas like Terry Heights and Hillendale across the country have a 22% dropout rate, but children in those neighborhoods that are involved in arts education, that dropout rate goes down to 4%. So what we're doing is making a difference. It's getting kids to reimagine their lives. That's amazing. Well, thank you again for, for being here with us today. You're welcome. There's another story in the Bible this one involving Jesus. A group of people come to him and ask him, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Now this was a pivotal question. The reason is because the Jewish people are living in Israel at this time, but the Romans have occupied the territory and now have Israel under their boot. If Jesus answers no, he runs the risk of being accused of starting an uprising against Rome. If he answers yes, then he can be accused by those present of not having true allegiances to Israel. So to answer this tricky question, Jesus does something remarkable. He grabs a coin and he holds it up. Much like our coins today have the images of some of our greatest leaders in our country's history, their coins would have had, had this as well. Jesus asks, whose image is on this coin? To which the people all answer, Caesar. Jesus responds to them saying, then give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is God's. To understand the profound nature of this saying, we have to take our minds all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, where we are told in the very first chapter of Genesis that God made humankind and God's own image. The implication from Jesus then is clear. The coin has Caesar's image stamped on it, so give it to him. But your life has God's image stamped on it. So give your life to God. This idea of image runs all through the Bible. We're told that we're made in the image of God. We're told not to make graven images or what we'd call idols as representations of God because as Genesis makes clear, humans are supposed to be representations of God. We're told that we've tarnished this image of God that we were created with. The Bible calls this sin. And we're told in Colossians 1 that Jesus has come as the perfect image of God. There's a Greek word for this too, and it's pronounced icon. It's where we get the English word for icon. So congrats, you know another Greek word. The word hasn't changed that much in meaning. Icon just means it's representative of something. An iconic brand means that something is so strongly embedded into our consciousness that it needs little to no introduction. Think of the Nike swoosh, the McDonald's M, the Apple Apple. All of this leads to the purpose of the Bible and the purpose God has for anyone who wishes to follow Jesus. 
it is for you to be recrafted from the image of God that we have tarnished into the perfect image of Jesus, the iconic image of Jesus. The Bible talks about this specifically in the books of Romans and 1 Corinthians, and it is closely related to the idea that we talked about a few moments ago, imitation. Let's play off of this idea for a bit. Say you took that coin out of your Kate Spade bag, your imitation Kate Spade bag, or you used it to buy your sports jersey, your imitation sports jersey. When you have an imitation product like that, the only way for someone to know that the product is a fake is if they hold it up to the real thing, or if they at least have an intimate knowledge of the real thing and what the real thing's supposed to look like. This is true whether it's handbags, sports jerseys, shoes, or even food products. And it's true of our spiritual lives as well. When Paul says we are to mimic or imitate God, it means we try every day to more and more replicate God and God's character. To try to be more indistinguishable today than we were yesterday and try more tomorrow than we were today. And when Paul says we are being made into the image or the icon of Jesus, it means that this process of imitating God or trying to be a knockoff brand is actually the process that God uses to make us more and more like Jesus. Have you ever heard of the ship of Theseus experiment? It's a philosophical question that asks, if you took a ship and replaced all of the boards on it with boards from another ship, is it still the same ship? But that's exactly what the Bible says God is doing with those who follow him. We're that imitation handbag, and slowly but surely, God, through Jesus, replaces the knockoff parts with the beautiful real parts that are supposed to be there. And when it's done, we'll not only be ourselves, we'll be the best version of ourselves. I asked earlier, in a year like we've just had, why has the show Ted Lasso struck such a chord with so many of us? Isn't this why? Isn't it because we're hungry for kindness, for honesty, for genuineness, for forgiveness, for lovableness? I think it is. And not only those things. Those things are mere shadows or imitations. What our world really hungers for, what it needs, is Christ-likeness. A group of people who desire to follow the Bible's call to be mimickers and representatives of the iconic image that is Jesus. And do our best to be nearly indistinguishable from him. At one point in the show, Ted Lasso says to a news reporter, For me, success is not about the wins and the losses. It is about helping these young fellas be the best versions of themselves on and off the field. That's quite a thing for an English Premier League soccer coach to say. But what if we who follow Jesus or who wish to said the same thing? We don't care about who wins or loses culture wars or elections. We care about being better versions of ourselves, better imitations of Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, Paul tells a group of Christians that all of creation is eagerly awaiting the day when the children of God will be revealed, when we will no longer be imitations, when we will be the people we were meant to be. And we do that not only by following Jesus, but imitating him and being remade into his image. You were created for that. You were destined for that. And our world is waiting for that. i
So glad you were with us today for TV Church. Check out tvchurch.info to find a number of helpful resources, like ways to connect or previous episodes. In particular, if you are curious about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, or even if you just want a refresher, then we invite you to go to that page and download a booklet that Travis has written with you in mind. Today, John talked about what it means to imitate and ultimately to become like Christ. As we move in that direction, let's close with this benediction written by Nathan Nettleton. Go out and imitate God, living in love. Put your hope in God's word and let your own words be truthful and constructive. May sin rouse your anger, but never let anger cause you to sin. Don't allow any room for evil. And may God always hear your voice. May Christ Jesus raise you to new life, and may the Holy Spirit nourish you for the life of love. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.